This podcast is for mature audiences only. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to From Crime to Crime. Hey, buddy. How's it going? Super great. We've taken a couple weeks off, but we're all recharged now and ready to hit the ground running. Yeah, sorry about that, guys. Trust me, we didn't do anything fun. It was still more work and for the podcast, just in a different form. Well, and other life work stuff. Helping family members move and stupid shit. (laughs) Yeah, that too. But we have a website now. Yeah, and it's running. We're like 80% sure. It's up, it's running. People are ordering things. It's going pretty well. So if you're interested in getting your From Crime to Crime merch, go to fromcrimetocrime.com. All right. So you want to get in? Oh, we got to do our five-star shout out. So Brian from the Royal Grumble podcast gave us a five-star rate and review. So- Thank you, Brian. We'll be listening to the Royal Grumble podcast imminently. Is that about wrestling? And yeah, it's definitely it's definitely about uh, WWE wrestling. Yes. So if that's your thing, that's where you go. I'm going to put Pa onto it. You're going to put Pa into WWE wrestling? No, into that podcast. He loves wrestling. <laughs> that's what he calls it, wrestling. <laughs> Does he tune in and like watches like Triple H and oh, he Stone used to Cold? Tape it on VHS. No. Oh, yeah. Really? 100%. Like Monday Night Raw? And yes. Really? Yes. Does he know it's fake? I could see that being something that would get past him. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he probably doesn't. <laughs> he probably is not sure. Yeah. yeah. We'll go with it. I like I liked that he t- <laughs> taped wrestling on VHS. Yeah. Now he can watch it just like on YouTube or whatever. He can watch it on demand. But back in the day, he yeah, used your to pa, tape it on a your VHS. Yeah, year old pa is definitely not using YouTube or really sure what it is. No, he has other people pull it up for him, though. (laughs) No, he does, because there's... No, I'm serious, because there's shows that he used to watch on this, like, RFD TV channel, which was, like, some Midwestern, like, channel about corn. I don't know. And he used to watch, like, three shows on that channel. Like, something... One was, like, a polka show, and one was, like... Um, Oh, my God. How Midwestern is he? Oh, he's like the most that you can be. Yeah. Yeah. All in. Yeah. And now he doesn't get that RFD TV channel anymore on whatever cable he's got. And it's still on? Yeah. Or, oh, wow. Oh, I I don't know. Maybe they're like 100-year-old episodes they just play over and over. Oh. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, there's one called Larry's Country Diner that's actually not good at all, but- they do have country artists come on and they like they have a musical guest every week and that's pretty good. Oh, like Florida Georgia Line or something? Oh, no, no, no. like real country artists. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So the music's real All good. Right. The show's kind of weird, but anyway, that's enough about this. Let's get into this. No one cares about this. Yeah. So for this week's episode, we're going to Harrington, Delaware. Delaware. Right where JB's from, right? Who's JB? Joe Biden. Oh god. I don't think we've ever gone to Delaware because nothing good obviously ever comes from Delaware. <laughs> Why would we go to Delaware? There's like there's a crossing and then what else? And Joe Biden. So I would never go yeah. there. <laughs> well, there's better options, but yeah. Elena Deladon plays for whatever team is I think she's from Delaware. She's a WNBA player, but that's kind of my extent of Delaware knowledge. Is WNBA still a thing? It is still a thing. They're actually pushing it pretty hard to make it a big thing and it, I think it's gaining some traction, honestly. It only took 40 years, <laughs> however long. Yeah, at least. Yeah, no, I know. But no, they seem to, I don't know. I follow all those sports things like ESPN and Bleacher Report and all that kind of mm. stuff. And they talk about it a lot. So I don't know if that's just them pushing it or if people are yeah, watching. I but I doubt it. If you're a WNBA fan, please come to our Instagram at From Crime to Crime and let us know. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so, Watch, we're going to get sorry. a handful of people, I bet. Mm. Okay. I like that you're the one shitting on the WNBA too. Like you're the WNBA bu- sucks, dude. It's <laughs> fucking get real. That's I'm sorry. There's some women's sports that are worth watching and there's some that fucking aren't. And WNBA is not. <laughs> I will say the WNBA has the best fundamentals in probably all of sports. They they do everything by the book, nice layups, good shots. Yeah, which is not interesting. Well, I didn't say that, but you did, and so <laughs> that will be the official from crime to crime stance. Yeah, no, we're against the WNBA. <laughs> we're against the WNBA. Yeah, we are. I don't know that we're against it, but like 
we're not watching it, but I don't think we're against it. Like, if there's a professional Nobody's women's sport. Nobody's watching it. <laughs> well, Everybody isn't watching it. Somebody somewhere is watching it, I think. No, I don't think so. They may not be. No, it's they're true. not. I'm pretty sure oh. they're subsidized by the regular NBA. That's a fact. I, I That is a, an absolute fact, I know. Last I heard, the WNBA has been, like, losing money for, like, the last 20 years, and the NBA has kept it afloat. But Yeah, ever. They just yeah. don't want to seem racist or sexist or whatever by canceling it. <laughs> a bunch of racists over there won't let the women play. Yeah, you know what I meant. <laughs> Everything's racist now. So, anyway, let's get into this episode because nobody gives a shit about the WNBA. And now we've given it more airtime than ESPN has in 20 years. Dude, I'm telling you, we haven't. The WNBA is getting a lot of play on ESPN. Okay, it's come big on, time. Grant. We're done with the WNBA. I'm just saying. Stop. I gotta cut all that out because I sounded like <laughs> such an asshole. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it sounds pretty good. Anyway, like I said, we're headed to Delaware in this episode. So on the night of June 22nd, 1991, do you want to guess what the number one song is? Oh, in 91, dude, it's got to be Gar. Is it Friends in Low Places? No, nope, but it is Garth. Um, okay. Think about okay. it. Just think about it. Summertime Garth. Oh, um, that summer. No. What? Uh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think of a Garth song from, was it off of No Fences? Yep. Um, Thunder Rolls? Yep. Oh, yeah, baby. Uh, that's so good. Yeah. So on the night of June 22nd, 1991... 41-year-old Charles Holden is headed home after working the 4 to 11 shift at the factory that he works at. 4 to 11. Okay, so he's working swing shift. That sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does suck. Wait, is it 4 a.m. to 11 or 4 no, p.m.? No, no, 4, 4 p.m. to 11. Okay, yeah, that sucks then. Okay, just making sure. Yeah, it does suck. But he lives on a farm. Like, his family owns, like, a 163-acre farm. Jesus. And his widowed mother lives like in the farmhouse and he lives on a trailer on the property. So that's probably why he works swing shift because he probably like works the farm during the day and then works at the factory swing shift. Yeah, it makes a little more sense. He's up early to feed the hogs. Yeah. Well, I don't know if they have hogs. I don't know what kind of farm it is, but what do they grow in Delaware? Um, I know. I don't know. I don't like, know the what they Midwest do The whole Midwest has got the corn game down. I don't know what Delaware's got. Yeah, I don't know what Delaware's doing. So anyway, long story short, he lives in a trailer on his family's property. It's a big property. And his 70-year-old mother, Dorothy Donovan, lives in the farmhouse that's on the property. So when he gets home, he sees a black man lurking around the property. And being 1991, he doesn't have a cell phone. So he heads back down the street and uses a pay phone to call the police. Just because he saw a black guy walking on his property? Yeah, well, he said he was, like, real sketchy looking. And you'll find out why he called. But a trooper responds and heads to Charles's trailer, and they check it out, and nothing is amiss. So they head to the farmhouse to check on Dorothy, his mom. And right away, they notice a broken window in the back door. So they real quick run inside to the master bedroom, and that's where they find Dorothy's bedroom covered in blood. Oh, jeez. Yep. And in the master bedroom, that's where they find the body of 70-year-old Dorothy Donovan. Ugh. I hope it, I was hoping it wasn't going there. Yep. And that's when Charles said to the trooper, I can't believe he killed her. Does this mean that now Charles is in charge? Possibly. So Charles said to the trooper, I can't believe he killed her. And the trooper said? I don't know. Nothing. But that's a weird thing to say. Is it? Yeah. L like, well, who killed her? What, what do you mean he killed her? Like, what are you talking about? Well, he called the guy because he saw a um, suspicious character on his property. So Yeah, that's true. So her body was taken to the medical examiner, and after the autopsy was performed, it was determined that she was stabbed 26 times with an unknown weapon. I'm going to say it was a sharp one. Yeah. But it wasn't a knife. It was some kind of unusual weapon. What other, like, what are people using? Like, do you think he used a sword? No, but, like, sometimes they use, like, an ice pick or... Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah. Yeah, just, it was some sort of different type of weapon. It wasn't a knife. But they couldn't really nail down what it was. So her body had been found in a position that would kind of suggest that she'd been sexually assaulted. But the medical examiner found no signs of sexual assault. Interesting. So she was in a position that suggested it, but when they checked her out, she was mm -hmm. good to go. Interesting. Yeah. So it was staged to look like hmm. she was assaulted, but she wasn't actually. Okay. This is interesting. That's weird. Mm -hmm. 
That's mm-hmm. really weird. Yeah. And nothing was missing in the home either, so robbery also didn't seem to be a likely motive. So with the overkill of the 26 stab wounds, the staging to make it look like a sexual assault when there wasn't one, authorities started to believe that maybe somebody close to her committed this murder and was trying to make it look like a stranger. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of what it's starting to sound like. Yeah. Which her son could is probably prime suspect number one, right? Yes. Charles is the first to be questioned, obviously. Charles is in charge of this murder. Yeah. And he says that after his shift that night, between 1130 and 12, he stopped at Hardee's to get a burger. And when he was walking back to his truck from the Hardee's, a black man stopped him and asked him for a ride to Georgetown, like 25 miles away. And Charles said, sorry, dude, like I'm not going out of town, but I am going that direction a few miles if you want me to take you as far as I'm going. But he's like, I'm not driving all the way to Georgetown. Yeah. And the guy was like, well, that's fine. Like, I guess just drive me as far as you're going and then I'll try to find another ride from there. So the guy got in Charles's truck and when they got a few miles down the road near the intersection where Charles had to turn to go to like his house, he told the hitchhiker guy like, hey, this is where you get out. And this intersection was still like a quarter or a half a mile from Charles's house, but he didn't want this random guy to know where he lived either. So he wanted to drop him off like on the main road. No, I mean, I, I think it totally makes sense. And I wouldn't want someone to really know exactly where I lived either. I don't even like saving my address and the home button on the GPS just in case right. someone finds my case phone or something. your car gets stolen. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't want them to know either. Yeah. This is when the hitchhiker, instead of getting out of the truck, he picked up a screwdriver that was in Charles's truck and told him to give him his keys and his truck and all of his money. Like he tried to rob him. With a, and, with a screwdriver from his own truck? Yeah. He That's picked up poor. Charles's screwdriver from the floor of the truck. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, Charles took the keys to his truck and got out and started kind of like running away from the guy. He, the hitchhiker ran after him and they got into like a physical scuffle and he attacked him pretty much with the screwdriver and told Charles that he had to drive him to Georgetown or he was going to kill him. Oh my God. Yeah. And so Charles agreed. He's like, whatever, dude, fine. I'll drive you to Georgetown. Just don't steal my truck. Don't kill me. You know, yeah. I'll drive you. So they go to get back into Charles's truck, but Charles hopped in it quicker than the hitchhiker did. So he just drove off. Hell yeah. Without the hitchhiker. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'd do too. So he says that he left the hitchhiker just stranded in the intersection and just boned out. And he said he was really, really shook up by the incident. So he wanted to drive around for a little while to calm down and so that the hitchhiker didn't see which way he turned and try to follow him home. Good point. I mean- I'd go to the police, right? Like, I wouldn't even go straight home after that. Like, I bet, I guess he's shooken up, but like, I would not be going straight home for sure, just right? in case. Yeah. So about 20, 25 minutes later, he says he, that's when he finally went home. And that's when he saw that same black man, hitchhiker, lurking around the outside of his house. He says it's the same guy? Yeah. And that's why you were like, why would he just call the police when he saw a guy? It's because he had an altercation with this guy. Yeah. And so that's why he drove away and found a payphone because that guy had just attacked him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So Charles tells the cops that he thought the hitchhiker maybe murdered his mom out of revenge for Charles not driving him to Georgetown. But there's no way he would have known it was his mom or his house, right? Right. So the cops are like, this story sounds off. Made up. Okay, good. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. They're like, this isn't right. So... But he still gave the cops a description. He said the guy was 5'9", black, thin, with pock marks on his face, and that he wore big, huge, oversized glasses. Ooh, 91. This could be Samuel Little. Yeah. It's a made-up story, so probably not. Oh. Okay, never mind then. <laughs> right. <laughs> Even though the police were like, yeah, this is straight-up bullshit. This is the worst story. Like, the house was a half a mile away from where he dropped him off. How would this guy know where his house is? Like, this is a wild story. But they did drop a sketch anyways, just... Because. Why? Well, because Charles was sticking to his guns and he said that's what happened. So they were trying to, like, not be biased at first. So they still drew up a sketch of this guy. They just didn't use the the best sketch artist they had. They were just like, eh. Yeah. <laughs> they also asked Charles to take a polygraph test, which he refused. Probably a good thing. But that only made them more suspicious of his story. They're like, why won't you take a polygraph test? And he's like, I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even though we tell people not to, I kind of want to take one just to, you know, get hooked up and see what happens. But you you shouldn't. We don't recommend well, it. But it is Yeah, even though 
it's not a good idea to take one, it always does seem a little suspicious when somebody won't take one. Totally. 100%. That's the thing is we know don't do it. But if you don't, like then people start to question you pretty hard or at least look at you really hard. Yeah, you're 100% going to be number one suspect after that. Yeah, you got a lawyer up on, like, if anything. (laughs) So, obviously being suspicious of Charles, they tried to check into what motive he would have had to kill his mom. Because apparently they had a pretty decent relationship. Obviously, I mean, he lived there, not in the same house, but obviously they got along well enough that they lived on the same property. I mean, yeah. I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean they get along. I mean... Especially right, if... but he said they got along, and the family says they got along. Oh, okay. So they're trying to figure out what his motive would have been to kill his mother if they did get along. So when they start digging into their finances, this is when they find out that Dorothy had taken out a life insurance policy less than a year before her murder, like on herself. And Charles was the beneficiary. So if anything happened to her, Charles would get paid out. So we found a motive. Yes. We also found out that Charles was in some debt. And I can't find anywhere that it says how much debt. It just says he was in farming debt. So I don't know if he had to, like, buy equipment or... I I don't know what farming debt amounts to. I don't know, but it's probably a lot. Yeah. So money, obviously, was would have been the motive that they're thinking. They're like, he's in debt. She just got a life insurance policy less than a year ago, and he's the beneficiary. This is obviously why he killed her. Another interesting thing is that the weapon used to stab Dorothy, remember I said it was unknown? Uh Uh-huh. The medical examiner said that it could have been consistent with a screwdriver. I was going to ask you if that's what it was. Yeah, and this is another big red flag for the detectives because Charles says the hitchhiker attacked him with a screwdriver. So it's like, how would he know what the murder weapon was? Well, I mean, the story would add up. You know, he was attacked by this guy with a screwdriver and then screwdriver was used. I mean... The only thing so far that like doesn't really add up is that she was left in that position and not had been sexually assaulted. And obviously we know there's a life insurance policy out on her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. By this point, the police are pretty convinced that Charles got off work, stopped and got a hamburger at Hardee's, went home, killed his mom. Then he cleaned up, ditched the murder weapon and the clothes he was wearing in that 30 minutes where he was driving around cooling down. And then he went to the payphone and called the police. Like, that lines up for what the police are thinking. No, and I get that that makes sense, too. But, I mean, that's yeah. why he would know what the murder weapon was, because that had happened to him earlier. So that still makes sense that he would yeah. know. But I don't believe but the they, story. Don't get me wrong. But That's what I was going to say, is they think he made this ridiculous story up about the Oh, I think so, too. I absolutely yeah. think he made it up. Yeah, because that would cover the missing time when he was murdering her and cleaning her up. This, Absolutely. This wild story. So there is one problem, though, with the police's theory that he did it and that he's lying. There was physical evidence at the crime scene that didn't add up to Charles being the murderer. Oh. There was a bloody palm print on the banister, and that palm print did not match Charles. Was it connected to the West Memphis 3 handprint in the Bojangles bathroom? No. Oh, okay. There was also a blood smear on a light switch that they thought was the killer's blood from breaking the window in the back door and then flipping on the light. They think he might have cut his hand, and that blood also didn't match Charles. Who, I mean, well, it's 91, I guess. They didn't really, they weren't really testing, but it didn't match the mom's either, I'm guessing. No, no. Okay. So the, he could have had an accomplice, though, or he could have hired somebody to do it. Like, because that's kind of what they're thinking now. They're like, well, he's still the one with the motive. Huh. But they couldn't arrest him without knowing who the blood on the light switch and the palm print belonged to. Because that'd be a big hang up for a jury to be like, well, what's this palm print and what's this blood if it's not him? They need to find the accomplice or the hired hand if that's what's going on here. So the police do interview all the people that were at the Hardee's restaurant, and they said that there was a man there who matched the description that Charles gave. Really? Of the... Yeah. And so... But but they knew who it was. And when they tracked this guy down, he had a full beard. So the police ruled him out because they determined there wasn't enough time between the attack and when they identified him for him to have grown a full beard. Because Charles says the so-called hitchhiker was completely clean shaven. So huh. the guy that was at the Hardee's that other people recognized when they went to interview him, they were like, oh, this isn't the guy. He's got like a, a six month old beard. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting pretty good at guessing these things, but I got to be honest. I have no idea what's going on now. <laughs> Neither do the cops. 
but they're pretty sure where we're at right now, we're pretty sure that Charles hired somebody to kill his mother or he had an accomplice, one or the other, because there's proof that there was somebody else in the house when she was murdered. But Charles is still 100% the main suspect in, in this, but they didn't have any hard evidence to charge him. The only hard evidence almost exonerated him. Yeah, really. Yeah, so three years after the murder, Dorothy's case was featured on Unsolved Mysteries with Robert Stack. Um, I'm sure you watched it. Oh, yeah. But the episode didn't lead to any tips or anything new in the case, which is kind of rare. Like, Unsolved Mysteries used to solve everything in the 90s. <sighs> yeah, they did. Yeah, because everybody watched it. So it was kind of it was kind of <laughs> We only weird, had seven it... channels. There wasn't a whole lot else to watch. Yeah. But it was just kind of weird that it didn't even lead to any tips or anything. So the case was just stalled for years. But they did have that bloody palm print and the blood smear on the light switch. So in 2005... Oh, that's a big jump. Yeah. I mean, the case had been cold for like 15 years. Yeah. They got the DNA from the blood smear and they put it into CODIS. Okay, great. And they got a hit. Okay, we're getting somewhere. What did it hit on? It matched a guy named Gilbert Cannon. Okay, So Gilbert Cannon was 26 at the time of the murder, and they pull a mugshot from back then because he's got like an extensive criminal history. So they're like, well, let's find the mugshot closest to the murder. Already at 26, he has an extensive criminal history? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, by this point, he's not 26 anymore. He's well, but he was 26 when this happened. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, I got you. I got you. Yeah. So they go back and they pull a mugshot from 1990. And he looked a shitload like the sketch that was made off of Charles's description of the hitchhiker. Oh, no way. Bogus sketch. Yeah. Yeah. The one we made fun of him about. Yeah. You're making me look bad. I thought you were leading me down to the promised land and you totally did a 180 on me. No, not yet. I haven't done a 180. Okay. So a few years after the murder of Dorothy Donovan, this Gilbert Cannon was arrested for armed robbery in Maryland. And he served like 10 years for that. And he was just released in December of 2004. And by 2004, felons were required to give DNA for CODIS. So right before they released him, they took his DNA. But apparently, it took a while to get it loaded into CODIS. And in the meantime, he was released. So he's released from prison in December of 2004. Then in 2005, a week after the police put the DNA from Dorothy's case into CODIS, Gilbert Cannon's DNA was loaded into CODIS. And that's what made the hit. Wow. Isn't that wild? 15 years later, what is the chances that a week apart from each other, the case and his DNA gets loaded into CODIS? I don't know. I'm bad at statistics, but it's got to be pretty far apart. Yeah, Yahtzee. Here's the issue, though. They had no idea where he was because he had been released from prison in December and he was not the type of guy that, like, owned property or paid his taxes or, you know, they had to, like, track him down. They don't keep an eye on you for at least a little bit after you leave prison? I mean... They're supposed to if you're on parole, but he may have just served his whole sentence. He may not have even been on parole. Oh, you can get out and not be on parole? I thought, like, I know what parole is, but I thought, like, you, like even when you got out, like, hey, we're going to make sure that you're still kind of doing the right thing no. for six months. No, really? No, no. No, not if you've served your whole sentence. Man. Parole is only if you get out early. Oh, yeah, no, if you served your whole that. sentence, you're, you did what you were supposed to do. I didn't know that. I thought it was kind of, it stuck with you for a little bit. Uh-uh. No. Well, probably should. So, well, that's why I don't feel bad for people who are on parole that are like, oh, it's so hard and they make you do all these check-ins and all, you know, you have to pass all these drug tests and no alcohol. And it's like, dude, you're supposed to be in prison. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, they're letting you do your sentence not in prison. Like, just be cool, man. You could play Mario Kart. Yeah. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, go check in every once in a while. It's no big deal. So, anyway. (laughs) So, it takes a while for them to track down this Gilbert Cannon. But in January of 2006, they finally track him down and they bring him in for questioning. And he denied killing Dorothy at first. But then they were like, hey, though, how would your DNA be on the light switch of this crime scene? And how is your palm print in blood on her banister of her staircase? He wasn't missing a hand, was he, by any chance? Yeah, no. Okay, just making sure. (laughs) Yeah, so he was like, ah, shit, you got me. So he tells them... Oh, man, you have that kind of evidence? Okay, I'll spill. Yeah. 
Yeah, so he tells them what happened. And he said that he was high on cocaine that night and he was looking to score more cocaine. But his only connection was in Georgetown, which is the next town over. So he was walking around the parking lot of Hardee's asking people for a ride when a guy told him that he could take him a few miles up the road but not all the way into Georgetown. So this story was real. Damn. (laughs) So far. So Gilbert said he got in the car, and when the guy stopped and said he couldn't take him any farther, he picked up a screwdriver from the floor of this guy's truck and tried to force him to drive him to Georgetown. He says they scuffled in the road, and then he threatened to kill the guy if he didn't drive him, so the guy agreed. And then when they went to get back in the truck, the guy hopped in the truck super quick and drove off. And they were like, holy shit. Yeah. So he's just standing in the middle of the intersection. He doesn't know what to do. So he just started walking and he was looking for a house to sleep in or possibly rob. I mean, robbery seems to be kind of what he ended up getting in trouble for a lot. Yeah. But he says he was looking for a place to sleep. And, which doesn't he's, seem like would be high on your priority list when you're on cocaine. That's but, what I was going to say. If this yeah. guy is strung out on croca- cocaine, he's not looking for a place to sleep. He's looking for more coke or something to sell for coke. Right. So he says he walked by a few houses and properties that had lights on. And then about a half a mile away and a few turns later, he came up on a dark house. So he broke the back door window and he went in. And that's when he realized that. Dorothy was home and he said that he was afraid that she would be able to ID him because she saw his face. So he had to kill her. And that's when he stabbed her 26 times with the screwdriver that he took from Charles's truck. Wow. So when the investigators asked him how he knew which house was Charles's mom's house and how he knew Charles and how this like all went down, he's like, who the hell is Charles? No way. Yeah, and they're like, the guy you attacked, dude, the guy in the truck that you took the screwdriver from, Dorothy was his mom. And this Gilbert Cannon guy was like, the fuck are you talking about? Oh, uh, now I'm confused. He's like, I didn't know that guy. He just gave me a ride from Hardy's. And they were like, so you didn't target his mother on purpose? And he's like, no, he had no idea that Dorothy was Charles's mom. This is the first thing that kind of actually makes sense. Like, because we said that in yeah. the beginning, like, how would he have known? He didn't. It was a it, total fucking coincidence. How many houses were around, though? Because, I mean, I know he dropped him off like at an intersection. They said he passed by multiple houses and properties. But he said there was lights on in all of those houses, which is why he didn't choose any of them. Oh. Well, wow. Damn. Yeah. So he didn't know Charles. Charles had nothing to do with his mother's murder. He was telling the truth the whole time. That batshit banana story, the whole thing was true. Dude, that's wild. Like... I didn't believe that guy's yeah. story at all, and now I feel really bad. Right? as Like, at all. Yeah, Even when I mean, he was like, this guy asked me for a ride from Hardee's to George. I was like, no, he didn't. <laughs> you know, like, Dude, that's so wild. Like I, I, like I said before, like, I feel like I'm getting pretty good at figuring these things out. Yeah. And I thought that the whole thing was complete and utter BS. I didn't think it had any truth to it at yeah, all. It sounded like BS, right? It Doesn't it? Yeah. But I yeah. mean, also, I... I said, you know, he knew what the murder weapon was because they had that altercation. So, yeah, that would make sense. But yeah. So the only thing is that Charles always thought that the hitchhiker targeted his mother because of the altercation they got in and because Charles wouldn't drive him to Georgetown. But this guy said, no, it was just a total. He didn't know it was Charles's mom. So it was just a total coincidence. Really? So, okay. Well, so what ends up happening to him now? Like, does he go to jail? Does he get prosecuted? Does Charles see him and, like, testify against him now? No, he he pled guilty and went to prison for life. Oh, just like that. Yeah. I mean, he was fucking caught, man. His blood was... Yeah, he was caught red-handed. And, <laughs> like, yeah, literally. <laughs> like, that's what it's for, right? blood on the staircase. Yeah, like, he was caught. Totally. That's why they they are pretty sure this whole story is true, because there would be no reason for him to lie for Charles. Like, if Charles did hire him... Yeah, really. Or something, you know... He might get a lighter sentence by trying to throw Charles under the bus, and he didn't. He's like, no way, dude. I don't even know that guy. And I definitely didn't know that was his mom. We were making out Charles to be a real bad dude. I know. He's he's just a hardworking guy. He's just trying to make a living, work on the farm in the morning. I had him tried and convicted already like halfway through this episode. (laughs) Oh, man. I mean, I was kind of thinking like, wow, this is going to get really crazy, but- then he told the exact story, and it was like, no, this is legit. Wow, that was 15 nuts. years later. 
Yeah. 15 years later, and the hitchhiker story was exactly the banana story that Charles told them. And that's what's nuts is like word for word almost. Yeah, but that means it's true. That means that's what happened. Nobody's Oof. embellishing this story at all. That's what happened. That is nuts. So luckily, though, that palm print and the DNA on the light switch was there. Otherwise, Charles may have gotten some jail time over this or convicted. You know what I mean? Like, Oh, yeah. I mean, it pretty much was like, obviously, he did something, and then turns out he didn't. No, I mean, there was a lot that pointed to him doing it. I'm glad they weren't able to convict him. I mean, I'm glad that there was a red handprint, you know, there, because otherwise he's probably going to jail, right? Yeah, I would think. If there was just no physical evidence, I would think they would have probably... Yeah. Arrested him under circumstantial evidence, you know. And I mean, hearing that story, a jury of his peers like we would be, I mean. 100% would have convicted him. Beyond 100%. reasonable doubt. Yeah. I. That was beyond reasonable yeah. doubt, I would have thought. Yeah. That's the only reason why they didn't, though, was because of the palm print and the DNA made reasonable doubt. And they knew that the jury wouldn't be able to convict unless they knew whose that was. Wow. I know. So. Okay. Well. All right, buddy. Well, I love you. All right. I love you, too. Okay. All right. Happy Mother's Day, everybody. Happy Mother's Day, mamas. All right. Love you. Love you, too. Bye. Bye. This podcast has been a production of Orange Halo Media, LLC, hosted by Grant and Erica. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. To chat with us, go to From Crime to Crime on Instagram, From Crime to Crime on TikTok, From Crime the Number 2 Crime on Twitter, or you can visit our website at FromCrime2Crime.com. See you next Wednesday.